Hey everybody, welcome to today's webinar on native plants. Um, we're happy to have Caitlin with us today from our Maryfield store to discuss uh, these plants with us for the fall. Um, I'm gonna get through all this introduction really fast so she has plenty of time to cover some of these beautiful plants that are behind her on the screen. Um, but a few quick notes. First of all, if you've attended these classes in the past, of course, welcome back. Uh, just bear with me because I know you're familiar with our procedures. Um, if you're joining us for the first time today, we're really glad to have you. Uh, a couple of notes about the way this Zoom works. This is a webinar format, so we actually can't see your faces um, and you're not able to talk to us. So if you have questions during the class, look at your Zoom menu. There's a Q&A box. If you click on that button, uh, you can type your questions into Q&A and I'll be giving Caitlin questions during the class. Um, she will be taking them throughout. Uh, just know I'm gonna try and keep it to what's related to the subject matter she's discussing. So if you have questions not related to what she's talking about, that's fine. Uh, we're just gonna hold them for later. Um, if we don't get to your question today, uh, just know you can always email us, hit reply on that uh, confirmation notes and you can send us your questions following class. And we are recording, so that link is gonna go out tomorrow. Um, I think that is about it. Uh, so Caitlin, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you so you can get started. Excellent, all right, thank you. Um, so bear with me, this will be my first Zoom. I'm used to doing sort of more live interactions, but what I'm first gonna to cover today is why are we interested in native plants? So the easiest answer is we're enhancing the ecosystem. So we really wanna create the natural biodiversity. That way we can not just enjoy our yards, but we can admire bees and butterflies and birds as they come to visit the outdoor space that we've created. Um, I think that it's really important to mention that I'll be showing you a few true species that'll be straight natives, as well as what's called a native R. So a native R is basically a native species, same genus, same species, but it's been cultivated into a more fancy, more aesthetically pleasing um, plant, something a little bit less straggly than what we see in the wild. And the reason why I think native ours are important is if we create something that is aesthetically appealing, then we're more inclined to, I guess, inspire our neighbors to do the same thing. And before you know it, one neighbor, one more neighbor, and then the next creates a uh, green corridor. So you're really enhancing the environment by doing this. So let's start off first and foremost with some of my shade plants. This first one, this is going to be Tiarella cordifolia. So this Tiarella is a native of ours. It's called Pink Skyrockets. You can reference the photo right here on the front. So they get uh, foam flowers, the common name. They get these really delicate light flowers in spring which helps provide a nectar source for bees as they're emerging during those warm spring days. Um, we've also got another early spring native. This is Iris cristata. So unlike Iris virginiana, which is a taller, more sun-loving native iris, Iris cristata grows in woodlands. A little bit of morning sun goes a long way and they're fairly drought tolerant. Okay, now I'm just gonna jump right into one of my favorite shade plants, especially since we're talking about dry environments. So this one, very similar to Tiarella, is Hookera. I am obsessed with Hookeras because they have these beautiful, large, gorgeous, broad foliaged leaves. They're also semi-evergreen and drought tolerant. So whenever we're planting these, what I like to do is dig a hole twice the root ball size, and I'll do about two thirds Virginia fine mulch, I'll remove the clay, and I'll do about a third of Maryfield planting mix. So that improves the drainage, allowing the plant to become more established, which and then is going to allow it to really stretch its legs. And once it gets to our native clay soil, it'll do just fine. So there's three different types of hookra species that I'm going to mention today. Um, the first one's going to be hookra americana, so this little lovely baby here, this cultivar is called Dale Stream. Now, Hookera Americana is going to be more native to the Northeast as well as the Midwest, and it's going to behave very similarly to the other Hookeras. 
Now there's also gonna be Heuchera velosa, which includes your autumn brides. These are the ones that you'll see most common growing throughout Virginia. They've got these large broad leaves, they're fairly tall, and they get these white flowers, thus the name autumn bride. This Heuchera right here is one of my personal favorites. This is Pallas purple Heuchera. Now Pallas purple is Heuchera macrampi. It's more of your West Coast, um, Hucaras. And I just think that this adds a lot of interest with its, again, the leaves, but also it's just a really stunning plant and has a nice structure. Now, if your hucaras are starting to get a little bit leggy, that is, you're noticing like a thick stem kind of climbing up and the leaves are sticking off like an umbrella, what you can do is plant it a little bit deeper and that will allow and extend the life of the plant. So it's just looks better as well as it's healthier. And you can also divide up your hookahs every three to four days. Hookah, hookah, hookah. All right. <laughs> another good um, one of these is, uh, this is another West Coast. This is Gullathera or wintergreen. And it gets its name because these berries right here are actually edible. Um, they have a faint mint taste to them, and you'll see mockingbirds feeding off of these. Now, as another West Coast plant, what you're going to want to do is, again, improve the drainage and give it more morning sun, spare it the heat of the afternoon. So these guys, you'll also see growing everywhere, like in Oregon and Northern California. Thanks, Caitlin. Can you say the scientific name of that again? Gullathera. Gullathera, okay. The winter green, yeah. Winter green. Um, let's see. And this cultivar is cherry berries because she has a very pronounced, beautiful berry. Um, again, make sure that these guys are in well-draining soil because during our summer heat, they're going to do a little bit of a dormancy period. So they're not going to be really thrilled with the heat and they need to be spared some of those uh, summer showers, okay? Now, a little bit closer to our region, right here is Carex pensylvatica. So this is a sedge grass. They grow fairly short, they'll grow in shade, they tolerate our clay soils. And it's a really lovely alternative for that person that's got grass growing under their oak trees and it's just not getting established. This will give you that nice aesthetic and they get these really clever little uh, black plumes or inflorescence is gonna be the technical term for any feathers that you see on your grasses and that'll happen early spring. So nice evergreen grass that's native to this area. We've also got- How much sun can that plant take? So if it's moi like a more moist location, it can tolerate a decent amount of sun. Okay. If it's like all day, every day up against the asphalt of your driveway, that might be pushing its limits, but they will tolerate some sun as long as there's moisture involved. Got it, okay, thank you. All right, now this lovely, this is another native that you're gonna see in our area. She would not normally be blooming now. This is a bleeding heart or dicentra eczema. Uh, this one I'm holding right here happens to be a true species. There's also cultivars like Luxuriant, which has a little more sagey, thicker fringed foliage and a pinker flower. The reason this one's in bloom, and you'll see this a lot in nurseries, is the way that they're produced. They're grown in greenhouses, so they're kind of tricked into blooming out of their normal period. And you'll see that throughout this presentation. There's a few things that aren't really popping off at the appropriate time of year. So this is a good example of that. And uh, these plants do really, really well if you have them in like just a few hours of morning sun so that they can propagate blossoms and then shade. I planted one myself about a month ago and it's probably tripled in size. So. Big fan of this one. Now, while we're doing fall plantings, this one right here, Styloflorum, is a woodland poppy. They get these yellow flowers to them in spring, and it's good to get these in the ground now so that you can appreciate their blossoms by next season. So get them established now that we're past the heat of summer, and that way you can enjoy them more in the spring. All right. Another Kate, question come in that you might be answering um, that this is probably one that a lot of people are going to have given the quality of the soil around the area. Mm -hmm. um, this person says I have terrible soil, mostly clay and rock. I cannot dig too deep. Do you have any recommendations? So as you can wait and cover that later, but I just want to let you know that that question has come in. Um, so I don't know if it's going to come up or um, I just know that's a really common issue. So 
No, that's absolutely an issue. And it's one of the reasons why natives, thank you for that question. Uh, it's one of the reasons why natives are so important. They naturalize really well. They're attuned to our natural cycles with rain and they adapt to our soil well. So when it comes to planting, I like to give my plants a little bit of a competitive advantage. I grew up in areas without this much dense clay. So I'll set the clay to the side and I use it for garden edging. And that's when I'm planting an individual plant. I don't have time to be digging up a whole flower bed from scratch. Also, it's really not that great to be doing that much disruption to the soil. You're messing with those little microorganisms that live in there. Um, so personally, and again, this might be controversial, but personally, I just like to dig a hole the pot size and a half, sometimes twice as large, and then I'll save that clay. And I again do the Virginia fine mulch and Maryfield planting mix. Now, the reason why I do the two bags is I can adjust what I'm using to um, get the plant the best established. So for the hookahs, it's gonna be two parts fine mulch and one part planting mix, that way there's better drainage. But if I'm going to be planting something like an ostrich fern, I'm not gonna be as delicate or worried about amending the soil because these guys grow all over our forest. They love moist soil, they can tolerate clay. They're a little bit more um, easily acclimated. I still wanna spoil mine and I'll do half Virginia fine mulch and half planting mix just so that it's got those nutrients and can really get a head start. But there's gonna be a lot of natives that are well suited for this environment. It just comes down to planting them in the right location in your yard. So how much sun versus how much clay and water. Um, things that get a little bit less light than they want probably are going to want less water than what they would normally have. Got it, okay, that's great information, thank you. Okay, so I was just talking about the woodland poppy. Another spring bloomer, it's gonna be spring, early summer, it's going to be Chrysogonum. Now Chryso oh no, this is Chrysogonum. It's easy to get the two confused. This is Picara. So Chrysogonum, and this is cultivar Pierre, has these tiny little yellow flowers to it. Again, a good nectar source early season. And um, it's just a really nice native ground cover. Um, if it's in more sun, it's gonna want a little bit more moisture. And again, if it's in more shade, you're gonna want it to be more well-draining. Can you spell spell that? I actually have no idea how Chrysogonum is spelled. So I might have to cheat here. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. C-H-R-Y-S-O-G-O-N-U-M, Chrysogonum. All yes. right, there you go. All right, I've sent it to the chat for anybody who uh, wants to write that down. Thanks. And Species name is Virginianum, so Virginia, Virginianum, um, and this is just a native art called Pierre. <laughs> All right, so now I've got, I got the two confused, easily done. Uh, this is Senecio. Senecio is going to be another early season bloomer. I um, got a little sidetracked on a road trip going through Shenandoah. I think this was around maybe May. And there was just fields and fields of these ye little yellow daisy-like flowers. And that was actually the Senecio just taking off in full bloom. So these guys can grow right on the edge of a forest or a little woodland edge, even into meadows if they're a little bit more moist. So doesn't look like much, but in mass planting and a lot of these plants will naturally self-propagate themselves. Another benefit to natives. Um, it's just really beautiful. It creates an awesome early season meadow. Okay, so that's that side. Ferns. So I did just show off our ostrich fern here. Now the ostrich ferns are awesome. They get I call their bases like little pineapples and they're the ones that get these really broad fiddle leaves to them and you can actually eat the fiddle heads. It tastes like uh, string beans, but ferns are awesome. Um, one of my favorites is the maiden hair. So maiden hair is going to grow in fairly similar conditions to the ostrich fern. It can handle very deep shade. It likes moist, rich, well-draining soil. Um, this one, you might get a little bit more rot on it if um, it's really in a solid, wet location. It 
likes its moisture. It doesn't want to dry out. If it does, you'll notice crinkling on the leaves really fast. But um, it's got this gorgeous, delicate texture and these really stunning black stems. I don't know if you can see those, but it's just fairy garden worthy, if you ask me. And then I have, so both of these ferns, as well as these two, I've got a royal fern here. Osmunda regalis is going to be the scientific name. And she looks very similar, the royal fern, to this one, Anoclea sensibilis. And this is your sensitive fern. So all four of these ferns, your ostrich, your royal fern, your sensitive fern, and your maiden hair fern, these are all going to not be evergreen, but after that first frost, when the sensitive fern loses its leaves, I usually just kind of let it go natural and I'll prune them up in March. That way the new growth is able to come up if that's unsightly for you. Again, perennials keep a lot of their life in their root ball. So you can do the big whack back and fall if you want to. Um, I just like that top blanket for them over the winter months. But um, these ferns are another native. They can get a little bit straggly looking and some browning in containers, but once they get in the ground, they really take off. And I really like the sensitive fern in particular because it almost looks like it gets models on its broad fronds. We have a question about the ferns. Um, can yeah. you grow the ostrich fern or any of the others indoors in pots? I would not. So as perennials in our area, their preference is to have that time out in the middle of winter. They want to go dormant. Um, in fact, sometimes I get worried when we have warm winters because I know a lot of my perennials want to take a nap. So bringing them inside, they may last for a while, but more likely than not, they're probably just not going to cooperate with you. Okay. You see a lot of greenhouse um, maiden hair ferns. They are adiantums, which is the scientific name for maiden hairs, and there's beautiful ones. Um, a little bit of a challenge to grow indoors, but the ones that you buy in the greenhouse tend not to be the pedatum, which is the native one. They probably are a tropical or even a Himalayan variety that is more better suited for your indoors. Got it. Okay. So we have a couple questions um, about some other ferns. Um, if you can take a moment, the next question is, is the, is the cinnamon fern native? Cinnamon ferns are native. Um, we just got a bunch in stock this morning, of course, right after I loaded up my vehicle for this. Okay. Um, so cinnamon ferns are awesome, native, and I think they get their name cinnamon from their fronds, their seed heads that come up. They're almost identical to my hair color. Um, yeah, yeah, that is cinnamon-like. Mm -hmm. um, all right, next question is actually back to the bleeding heart. This person has a dicentra, which has been dying back a lot. At this, She wants to know if that's normal at this time of year, if you should be worried if your bleeding hearts are dying back at this point. So bleeding hearts, especially in Virginia compared to like North where it's a little bit cooler, do tend to suffer from some of our heat, which again is why you want them They'll drink a decent amount of water in the spring, which is wonderful since we get spring showers, but they are not big fans of our summer heat. And as such, they're gonna go dormant and then they can be a little bit sensitive to water. Um, Dicentra spectabilis, which is like your grandmother's bleeding hearts, the large ones that kind of spill over and they're definitely heart-shaped. Those guys practically always go dormant during our summers here. Um, the fringe leaves, the eczemas, tend to hold up a little bit better, but if you're noticing some browning and disappearing of foliage, it's not the end of the world. I would give mine a little investigation. So what you're gonna do there, and you can even see on this one, there's been cutbacks on it because it's lost a few leaves, but you're gonna go to the crown and you're gonna give it a good wiggle. And if that feels solid to you, you still have a lot of life in that root ball. If it starts to, fall apart at your wiggle, then you might want to dig it up and just investigate the root ball. Um, and this seems kind of weird, but whenever I get to that point, what I tend to do, pardon the dirt, is I will, um, I'll sniff it. And there is a difference between the smell of dirt. I mean, it doesn't smell like flowers or anything, but if it is root rotted, it's all going to fall apart in your hands. You won't see these nice, healthy white roots and it's going to have a really funky smell. You're going to know it's root rotted. 
All right, thanks. Um, Caitlin, we've got a couple questions about ground covers um, coming in. So just wanted to let you know, we've got some people looking for some evergreen native ground covers. Okay, so our evergreen native ground covers are um, a little difficult to come by. Uh, you can always do the hookahs that I had mentioned. Most of them stay around a foot, some of them a foot and a half. Um, one of my favorite native ground covers is Michella repens. This is partridge berry. It has a very delicate weaving vine to it, two leaves on each side, very delicate. Um, and you'll see these hiking. Um, I was enamored by one growing literally out of stump but it can be a little bit difficult to get established in our flower beds. You really have to be putting it on the edge of a rock wall in a little bit of sun, like just two hours a morning and well draining. So I've grown a few myself and the way I've been able to procure them is occasionally we will get them in the spring months. Um, it's not something that's always available to us. The market, um, as far as nurseries producing these plants that we want to provide to you guys, is just starting to grow. So everyone logging in to watch this today, everyone buying the native plants, again, you're enhancing the ecosystem and biodiversity, but you're also helping change the market. So that brings me back to thanking everyone for logging in today, because the more that we're planting natives, the more we're changing the industry and possibly seeing less purchases of um, the, you know, ivies as well as Pachysandra. Now there is another Pachysandra, Pachysandra procumbens or Allegheny spurge. That's going to be another native ground cover, but she is not going to be evergreen. Um, so we have to do a little bit of compromising when it comes to evergreens and ground covers. And the Pennsylvania sedge that I had shown you guys earlier, this is also another good ground cover. It's just not going to go crazy, crazy. I'm a really big fan of, and the hookahs tend to be more evergreen than your tiarellas, but tiarellas act as a wonderful ground cover. The straight species tiarella cordifolia will even get vines off of it that will send down roots and that allows the plant to spread. All right. So Carex is the Pennsylvania sedge, is that the Carex? That certainly is. Carex okay. Pennsylvanica. Okay, okay. So that's a good choice for someone who wants something that won't spread like too crazy. Yeah, it'll spread a little bit, but mostly it's just mounding. Um, okay. I've yet to see them self-propagate with their seed heads, but I'd be very open to uh, shaking up some seed heads in my yard and seeing if I can force that. It sounds good, thank you. Okay, any further questions or can we keep rolling on? No, I think we covered all of them so far. Um, we've had a question about the uh, composition of the Maryfield planting mix and if there's peat in it. Uh, if you happen to know that, that's fine. If not, I can send that to David Yost, he'll, he'll know more. I might have to re-reference that. I do know that the Maryfield planting mix, although it's not certified, it's got organic ingredients in it. Um, again, not certified, but it's all natural materials that provide nutrients to your plants. And Thanks. Okay, like yeah. So to the person who asked about that, send me a note and I can get in touch with David Yost about that. Um, he's got all of our information and can consult with people who work more with our soils. Okay. All right, that's it. Thanks, Caitlin. Well, these questions are actually getting us right on track for another, um, since we're discussing evergreens and ground covers, the last two ferns I kind of brought in today, and I am missing the lady fern as well as the cinnamon ferns, but um, I do have with me the Christmas fern, which is a polystichum arcto, I can never remember, across Ticoids. <laughs> there you go. Um, anyway, your Christmas ferns are evergreen, and these guys you'll see growing everywhere. They've got these really simple lobed uh, fronds to them, and they will get, this is actually really great, you can see one of them unfurling there. Um, yep. Yep. Um, so that's another really nice native fern, as is uh, Dryopteris marginalis, uh, most commonly known as the marginal fern or the evergreen wood fern. And a lot of your ferns, um, while the ostrich fern will propagate, just getting bigger and bigger with those little uh, pineapples coming up that you can divide, uh, most of your ferns are going to get uh, seed heads underneath their leaves. So those are their spores, their reproductive organs right there, um, and they'll self-seed that way. But this is a really nice evergreen fern. A lot of times 
with your evergreen ferns, it might take a season, two or three for them to truly be more evergreen than semi-evergreen. And it also depends on the winter. About how tall does the Christmas fern get? So Christmas ferns, I believe get around right two feet. Let's double check. Yep, 18 to 24 inches. So. Perfect, thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. And now let's go to the sun section. I'm just gonna scooch over some stuff. So one of the things I had mentioned was doing straight native species versus native Rs. And a really easy example of that is going to be Echinacea purpurea. So Echinacea purpurea or cone flowers tend to get three to four feet tall and the straight species can get a little bit leggy. Now this cultivar is almost identical to the straight species. This is still Echinacea purpurea, cultivar named Magnus. Now with Echinaceas, there have been a number of studies on whether or not pollinators prefer to go to the straight species versus the native Rs. There hasn't been any discrimination against Echinacea purpurea versus Echinacea purpurea magnus. In fact, I brought a really cool hybrid with me today. This is Rainbow Marcella. She is an Echinacea hybrid. She's got almost like this ombre tie-dyed flower petal to her. And I see bees on this cultivar more than any other. Um, you will see when it comes to those fancy hybrids that have just double freaky petals, they look like pom-poms, that the pollinators can't really get into the nectar source. So that's not really their favorite thing. So avoid stuff like that. But when you're planting natives, you can always put a few of these in the garden. You'll be admiring tons of bees, lots of butterflies. And it's also really neat because these seed heads, um, I'll let mine go for a while just because finches will feed off of them. So all around great backyard ecosystem plant and they bloom for weeks and weeks and weeks throughout the summer. Shorter cultivars like the Marcella will start blooming sooner and then the taller ones will chime in after that. And these need at least six hours of sun and they do like well draining soil. So again, amend, let it get established and then it'll be fine once it reaches your clay. Okay. Caitlin, do deer tend to eat the cone flowers? I have heard that they have done that, but they're not supposed to. Okay, um, that's I, how every, like everything with deer. Yeah, like I have a family of them in my yard and they haven't been nibbling on them. Um, you will, what I have noticed on my own echinacea, and I'm not seeing as much of it here, uh, there's a weevil that will like feed on the seed heads and you'll notice like, the cone getting black as well as like, you'll see almost like it's basically poop chilling out on the edge of the yeah, seed head. Um, and when that happens, I just cut it back because that weevil's actually in there. But the deer shouldn't be touching it. Again, emphasis on shouldn't. Oh, good question. Okay, here um, is a question. Can the echinacea overwinter successfully if it's planted in a large container? So anything in a container, I always compare it to um, being outside in the winter with snow pants on. That's gonna be the equivalent of plants in the ground. It maintains a solid 32 degrees. So it's a little bit warmer should the weather get really cold. Anything in a pot, that's the example of you being in shorts. If it gets stupid cold, you're gonna feel a little bit more susceptible to that. Um, that being said, I've had quite a few echinacea overwinter in pots. It's just only fair to mention that it doesn't always come through. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so pairing with echinacea, and this is kind of, I want to show you some good examples of companion planting. Um, so if I've got these beautiful echinacea where I'm kind of creating like a wildflower meadow, maybe a little bit more xeric or drought tolerant, so I'm not keeping up with watering as much. Um, I might want to add to the back side of that garden little blue stem or schizocarium. Um, she doesn't look very blue right now, and I'll give you a good close up on her inflorescence. These are her feathers or her seed heads. Um, so, what these do is early spring, you'll start to notice they come up with this really pretty sagey, almost teal colored foliage. 
And as it keeps growing, it'll turn even more purple and red, and then it'll finally go into inflorescence. And these will get about three feet tall. And I just think that these guys paired with a magnus just gives you a lot of broad texture with the flower heads and then the delicate texture of the foliage. I also like the idea of having a um, well-maintained and groomed meadow in my own yard. So I'm not going all willy nilly and letting it go wild. There's still some design structure to it, but a few grasses and some wildflowers, you can have the best of both worlds. Caitlin, uh, what kind of light does, are these full sun, these grasses? The yep. System? Okay. We've moved, um, so the sedge will take shade. The rest of the plants I'm gonna show to you are now gonna be in our sun section. Thank so you. anything that needs about six hours or more of direct sun. Okay. You get a few more points for afternoon sun. Um, so like you might squeak by with five for some plants, but I would definitely give this one the full six hours at least of direct sun. Um, and the reason we wanna do that is the plant, while it might be okay for a few weeks, maybe a month or two at a time, by the next year, it's gonna be getting really straggly and leggy. You'll even notice with like some of your flowers, they tend to get very leggy because they're reaching for the light and they'll get top heavy and they'll flop over. So you really want to make sure that you're giving them the light that they're requiring. Okay, so let's move on to one of my absolute favorites for pollinators. Hold on. Okay, this is Agastache or Mexican hummingbird mint or anise hyssop, which it gets its name from its smell. It is in the mint family, um, although I've noticed it to be a little bit less aggressive than some other mints. Now, this particular Agastache compared to the Rupestris, which is a shorter, a little bit more leggy, pretty orange flower grown throughout Arizona, this um, Agastache will actually grow throughout Kansas. You may even see it in Virginia. So it's native to North America, particularly below the Mason-Dixon line there. Um, so I love these because they almost act like an annual. They'll start blooming around late May and they'll keep going, especially if you're good about deadheading. So with deadheading, you're gonna remove the mature seed heads, cutting back thoroughly, or just going down to here if you got a bunch of buds already on the next stalk. Um, and that'll encourage more blossoms. So it's a continual source of nectar. You'll always see bees on top of these. And um, also with the, uh, this variety, the uh, blue, excuse me, blue fortune, as well as golden jubilee, they've got bigger seed heads. So little house um, sparrows, which are not native, but your finches and your other songbirds will feed off of the seed heads. Okay, um, next I'm gonna show you Coreopsis reticulata. Now this native R is Moonbeam. Uh, similarly is going to be Zagreb, which has a brighter uh, flower color. But at any rate, I think these guys paired together with your echinacea and your grass, you'll really be establishing a sun loving more drought tolerant garden. Um, and again, butterflies are gonna love this. Once you get a full round of blooms early summer, you can even cut it back fairly aggress aggressively. And that's going to encourage more flowers throughout the season. And it is a really good performer and rebloomer. Give your Coreopsis a little bit of breathing room though, because they're prone to get powdery mildew if they're overly crowded in a space. So good airflow and also powdery mildew. You can treat it with, I believe we sell a product called Renegade which is a biological um, answer to dealing with powdery mildew. It's actually a bacteria that eats the um, powdery mildew and it's not gonna kill your plants if you don't wanna be out there spraying. Basically it is a um, parasite that's feeding off live plant tissue and it's not gonna wanna kill its host. Speaking of powdery mildew, um, another commonly gets it plant for powdery mildew, but still well worth being in your flower bed is Monarda. Now this one right here is Monarda fistulosa. Um, this is a straight species. There's also going to be native Monarda didmias like Jacob Klein's. Those are your red blooming Monardas. Um, fistulosa is also called wild bergamot. So when we were, uh, I guess, protesting 
or doing like the uh, British tea, we ended up settlers used Minarda fistulosa wild bergamot to make tea. So it's kind of like an American revolution plant right here. Um, and yes, it's true to its name, common names bee bomb. The bees love this as well as hummingbirds. They'll just dive right in, and feed off of the uh, flower heads when they come into full bloom midsummer. And that's another good companion planting with your echinaceas, your coreopsis, your agastockies. And it's really gonna create a beautiful outdoor wild meadow look for you. And let's see. It's hard to drive by a roadside in the United States without seeing this one right here. This is, let's see, Vernonia or um, ironweed. So very similar to the Coreopsis, it has thread-like foliage to it. And at the end of summer, you'll notice it gets these beautiful little purple flowers. This one's starting to go into seed, which is perfectly normal for this time of year. But it's another really pretty native that's going to support pollinators. Okay, who else we got? Oh, Sue. We can't talk about pollinators without Asclepius. So this plant right here is Asclepius tuberosa. It is a butterfly weed. Also within the same genus, you have Asclepius incarnata, which is your swamp milkweed, and Asclepius syrinchia, which is common milkweed. Now, common milkweed, you can't, once you look up how that flower blooms and the broad, broad foliage on it, it's hard to drive by any sort of roadway in Virginia without seeing it just growing wild off the side. And uh, what these plants do is they provide not just nectar sources for monarch butterflies, but they are the host plant for monarch caterpillars. So all fall, we'll get customers coming in, actually, I guess late summer, we'll get customers coming in to restock on their Asclepius so that they can feed their caterpillars. And uh, also neat, one of our growers has started a campaign called Caterpillar Candy. So they have a bunch of different plant varieties that show you what type of butterfly as well as the caterpillar itself that are hosted by these plants. So also part of that series is another native, Sedum ternatum. So Sedum ternatum, this one's actually got quite a few bite marks going through her because caterpillars have been crunching on her. Sedum ternatum's a really neat succulent that's native to this area. It'll grow in wood sides as well as in hot, dry locations. And I believe it is the checkered fritillary that feeds off of these. Okay, and last caterpillar candy one. Um, this right here is Rudbeckia fulgidia. Um, silvery checker spot is going to be the butterfly that's attracted to this one. And again, this is your black eyed Susans that you'll see growing right on the forest edge, almost in marshy conditions. Um, I've got one in bloom right back here. Just give me one second. So this is another straight species. This is Rudbeckia fulgidia, variation fulgidia, um, compared to like Goldstrom, which is Rudbeckia fulgidia Goldstrom. Goldstrom being the native R, this being the straight species. Uh, the only notable difference I've seen between the two is Goldstrom has those bigger black-eyed Susan flower heads where, and a little bit more broad foliage to it. And it can be a little bit shorter. Um, and these guys will tolerate their moisture. They do need six hours of sun. They can maybe squeak by with like four or five of direct afternoon. Um, hey, Lynn, again, oh, yeah. sorry. We've got a question about the, um, about Asclepius beetles. They, so they spread like crazy. How do you deal with them? So this season, I just kind of made my peace with them. Um, <laughs> You can certainly, I guess, meme them, but you don't really want to, this is why I made my peace with them. If I'm treating for one insect, it's really difficult to be isolating that one and not affecting the caterpillars that are going to be feeding on the foliage. Um, and the reason why I'm making my peace with them is those uh, beetles, you'll notice them crawling all over the seed heads, especially with Asclepius incarnata, the swamp milkweed, as well as the common one. And when you observe them crawling all over those seed heads, they actually disperse the seed heads. So that's creating even more of that native plant throughout the area. So that's kind of been my compromise. 
I don't know. That's not probably an answer you're looking for just to deal with it. No, but I have good info. Thank, thank you. What? I said, that's good info. Thank you. I know David Yost talks a lot about how it's a balancing act when you're gardening based on what your goals are. So that's good. Good to, good to discuss. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So yeah, it's definitely a balancing act for sure. And it's about compromises. Am I going to grow a native that's going to be evergreen and doesn't spread as aggressively as some of the Asian varieties of ever or ground covers? Um, probably me per se, I will. <laughs> but there's some gardeners that just want it to be a little bit easier. And can you treat those beetles? Uh, yeah. You can emit a cloprid or spray them or do all sorts of poisons on them, but I wouldn't want my caterpillars to be subject to that. So also when it comes to things like the beetles or caterpillars or, you know, other insects that are going to be on our native plants, that's part of the allure for me. Um, so let me show you my next grass in that conversation. Um, this is Panicum virginigatum. So this is another native. It's even got Virginia Gotham up in its name. So they'll start off green and then they turn fun colors. Shenandoah is a red variety. This one is Ruby Ribbons, which actually has this beautiful striking foliage to it. And then it's inflorescence. Well, they're a little more appealing in mass. Um, but basically these guys are host plants for a bunch of caterpillars as well as crickets. So you might notice some insects feeding on the foliage, which then in turn attracts things like your uh, bluebirds. And bluebirds are plant or birds that really need us to encourage an ecosystem for them. Um, so if I'm providing them with little bugs for them to eat off of my plants, I'm not upset at that at all. In fact, it's a really good opportunity if you have kids to educate them on food webs and how we're participating and observing that. Caitlin, do you recommend that any of that these sun plants be planted in spring or fall? Is there a particular time that's best? Hmm. Um, I am insane and I plant stuff all year long um, just because I can't help myself. Um, I do try to get an advantage on things like when I was showing you the spring bloomers. Another example of that is going to be this one, the uh, Cisrinchium. This is a blue-eyed grass that gets really pretty delicate, almost like a purpley blue flower to it in spring. This is one I would want to plant now so that it can get established. We're already past the heat of summer. And then it can really stretch its legs out. And by next spring, when it's wanting to start blooming, it's already got that advantage of having been growing this, you know, fall into winter when it's gonna go dormant. So I think it's a good time of year to be planting most, if not all your perennials. And I am guilty of not just planning my garden and planting stuff for the next season ahead of schedule, which is almost ideal. Um, because I'm doing all that work in the yard, I also want to be putting in a few of those instant gratification. It's got flowers on it already plants. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, since we've been talking about bugs, I did get a hitchhiker today. I will return him back to Maryfield at Gallows where I work. Um, this is Veronicastrum or Culver's root. And when I got in the car, this guy did not want to like pop off. Um, so Culver's root is white when it's in its straight species, but this one has a really pretty light lavender flower to it. And I haven't observed any discrimination amongst the pollinators as to the white or the purple. In fact, both of them tend to be swarming on this plant. And I think these guys are awesome because it's a plant that looks so delicate and it gives you that beautiful spike. It's almost like the Veronica's that we plant all over the place for the same aesthetic purposes. This is just a really nice native variety. Um, or excuse me, it's not a Veronica, it's a Veronicastrum, but you know what I'm saying. Um, also with natives, a nice lavender color, asters. So I brought a few asters with me today. 
This one's probably my personal favorite. This is your heart leafed aster. Um, aster cordifolius, I got that going on there. Um, so aster cordifolius, you'll see them growing on the edges of woodlands or even on stream sides. They do need sun, but they can take a little bit more part sun. So if you're getting four hours of sun, this plant should do just fine. Uh, and these guys just, they'll bloom at the end of summer. I believe there's over a hundred um, mature insect species that use the nectar from these flowers. Um, so that's really important to creating our ecosystem. And uh, another one of my favorites, this is a calico aster. Um, cultivar name Black Lady. So these guys can get a little bit straggly and they do have smaller blossoms. They'll get two, maybe three feet tall. Um, I just really think that they're pretty and they've got these white petals, but almost maroon seed heads to them. And then, one moment. I've got Aster Novi Angli. So this Aster right here is Aster Purple Dome. So when we think about asters, there are a bunch of them that are native, not just to the United States, but also this area. Um, there's the three asters I just showed you. There's also Aster Novi Belgi, which is your New York aster. There's the aromatic asters, um, like Aster oblongifolius, that includes your October skies or your radon's favorites. But asters, again, are nice because when we're staggering our bloom periods within our garden, we're creating a constant food source for the butterflies and the bees. And it's really important that we maintain that so that they're not stopping by in spring and then there's nothing waiting for them in summer and again, late season fall. Okay. Next plant, since we're talking about fall. Oh my goodness. All right. This is Helianthus selectifolius. So I love a sunflower, especially when it's this time of year. They're beautiful and cheery. They fit the aesthetic for the season. And um, Helianthus selectifolius, your perennial sunflower, gets its name selectifolius like salix or willow because it'll tolerate some moist soil. So it really is well adapted to our clay. And when it's not doing that, because this variety, I believe this is first light, let's see, yep. First light, she'll get three to four feet tall. Um, when it's not in bloom, it creates, because it'd be in the back of your flower bed, it just has a nice foliage that, and it almost looks like little umbrellas on the top of the plant as it's maturing before the buds develop. And now is when they are blooming. And again, you can see these, not just in my garden, but you'll see them on the side of the road or when you're hiking. They're just a really nice native species that naturalizes well is great in the soil. And again, it's going to support, I think this one was, I want to see 75 different species of bugs that are into Helianthus. So she's another winner. And I'm loving all of the yellows and the purples this time of year. I think that's just perfect for doing your uh, fall decor outside. Speaking of purple, so now we're just kind of jumping around um, to some of the ones I have left. We're getting away from our companion planting layout. Um, the next two plants I'm gonna show you are going to have purpley foliage. So this one right here is a Eupatorium or a Joe Pie weed. A lot of us are more familiar with the Joe Pie that's like six feet tall and gets similar pink flower clusters to it. This one is chocolate and it gets its name from its dark foliage. So again, I'm gonna get some really nice contrast in my flower bed, incorporating all three of these together. I'm getting broad foliage with dark leaves. I'm getting delicate and all sorts of colors going on late season. And this is another one that pollinators are all over. Um, Rugosum is gonna be your species name. And about maybe three, four weeks ago, you would have seen a very similar plant growing on the forest edge, just white flowers, solid green leaves. And that again was Eupatorium rugosum. This is cultivar chocolate. And as we're talking about our dark leaves, as well as native ours, um, Lobelia cardinalis. You can't be talking about native gardening without discussing Lobelia cardinalis or cardinal flower. 
Now these can get four feet tall, big red flowers. They bloom in the middle of summer, right when the hummingbirds are feeding. So they're wonderful for hummingbirds and bees and butterflies. Um, I'm a big fan of the native ours for Lobelia cardinalis because they also have been developed to have dark foliage, which gives me more contrast in the flower bed. So this one right here is Starship Burgundy. And she doesn't just get that name from the burgundy like foliage, but they also have like a red flower very similar to the true species. Another reason that I planted, I've done maybe five or six different types of lobelia in my own garden. Um, I really like this variety because it stays around two feet tall. So it's a little bit more easy to manage, a little bit less staking. Um, now lobelia cardinalis, will sell them in our shade sections, um, but they're actually more of like a meadow right at the edge of a stream side. So it doesn't wanna be grown in constant moisture. It can take a wet spot as long as it's going to be well draining. And if it's going to be a moist location, it needs to get more sun. Um, don't plant these in the very darkest part of your yard. They need a few hours of sun at least just to produce blossoms and not get top heavy like we discussed earlier. Um, but Lobelia cardinalis is another great go-to for pollinators. And again, it can take its sun when tolerating moisture. So if you paired Helianthus and Lobelia, as well as the Eupatorium I showed you together, you'd have a really well-behaved, happy companion planting for those more moist, sunny locations in your yard. Okay, two left. So Picanthemum muticum, excuse me, Picanthemum muticum. This is mountain mint. So mountain mint, should be just finishing up its bloom right around this time of year. Their blooms aren't too like, I mean, it's no cone flower, but I really like these because they give you silvery foliage, which looks great with all those darker colors that you got going on. Also, it's one of my favorite mints as far as smell goes. It's very earthy, mountain minty, which is why it has its name mountain mint. Um, that and it grows in mountains. It will grow aggressively, um, just like most of the other mints. So bear that in mind when you're planting, give it some room to run because again, you're gonna wanna be letting it naturalize. And it is a uh, fan favorite as far as bees are concerned. This is one of the plants that when I'm working at the garden center and I'm walking through the aisles, I have to stop and just stare in awe at all of the bees that are hitting up the mountain mint. It is a wonderful plant. And I recently sold one to my buddy who has a bunch of hives. If he's watching, hope your mountain mint is doing well. Oh, how could I have almost forgotten? I have Spigelia. So Spigelia, Indian pinks. This is cultivar little redhead. Um, these guys are just starting to be a little bit more common in nurseries. Uh, it's a true native. They will um, propagate and get larger. And after like five or six years, it's just a stunning plant once established. They do get these little red flowers. And when they're open, they have like a little yellow crown on the top of their head. It is a striking flower. It has beautiful green foliage. It's a lovely native that grows right on the edge of the forest line. And I like to plant these with goldenrods. So there are several native species of goldenrod, especially in our area. This one right here is a shorter, more um, well-behaved goldenrod. This is Solidago uh, rugosa or a hybrid of it. So most of the rugosas are gonna be your shorter um, Solidagos. And I think the two together, that little bit of yellow and red, that's some really nice contrast. And last plant is Zizia. So Zizia aurea doesn't look like too, too much. And she gets these very delicate um, clusters of like pale yellow flowers in spring. But the reason why I had to bring Zizia today is um, it's a member of like the parsley parsnip family and it has true to the same, you know, other members of its family attracted some swallowtail caterpillars, which I did not know that native Zizia aurea did that until I saw them munching away maybe a few weeks ago. Um, so Zizia aurea, it'll bloom in the spring, 
but you want to have it in your garden just to encourage the uh, black swallowtail population and give their caterpillars a food source. This one did have not just caterpillars on it, but we were watching a swallowtail lay some eggs on it. Um, not seeing any today, so sorry for that letdown. Um, but are there any other questions before we wrap up? Yes, we have a few questions um, for you, Caitlin. The first is back to ferns. Uh, can you move and transplant, transplant ferns now or should it should you wait until spring at this point? Um, so with the ferns, and it depends on the fern, I would take stock of whether or not they have like those seed heads going on, if they have spores on them. Um, because if they have spores on them, in my opinion, and this isn't just like, I haven't read this anywhere. It just seems to me it would make sense to let them be until they're done reproducing. So moving a fern that has actively sporing fronds on it would be like transplanting something with flowers on it. You just don't want to really disrupt it, but it'll probably be fine. Ferns are very hardy, steady plants. Um, yeah, and I would wait probably for division, depending on the fern again, till early spring, if you're planning on dividing up ferns. Um, that way, once it gets through the winter, you're dividing it up right before it sends out new growth, similar to your hookahs. Okay, good, so the plant's not as active. Um, okay, so the next question is, it's better, is it better to plant cardinal flowers in fall or spring? Um, this person's had issues with growing and flowering, getting them to grow and flower, but she loves them, so she's wondering. If there's a better yeah. time to try. Oh, is it better? So I, because I've been growing quite a few of them myself, I've planted them at different times throughout the year. Um, the ones that I've planted in late fall did not do as well as the ones I planted in spring. Um, that being said, a lot of the lobelias that I've planted have been rescues from the garden center. So maybe some of my personal um, shortcomings have been the result of me just really taking a gamble on them. Um, so if you love them that much, I mean, plant them all the time. <laughs> and one of them's bound to take. Um, but I think it's probably better to do it in the spring when they're actively growing. That way they're able to get established and they're not like premature. Because I think the ones that I planted late fall that again were rescues, those were the ones that I had the most difficult time with. All right, thank you. We've got a couple questions about mountain mint. Um, just so everybody knows, if we don't get to all of your questions, I see more people are thinking of them. Just feel free to email us after class. Um, next question is, will mountain mint grow in the shade? Um, and a follow-up to that is, do you cut the mountain mix mint back in late winter as you would the ornamental grasses? So when it comes to cutbacks, first I'll address that. I might have to have you remind me the rest of it. Fine, when it comes to cutbacks, my policy has been when it's brown, cut it down. So a lot of old school gardening is just one and done, whack judo chop the whole flower bed at once and then you're done you're not like revisiting and doing your cutbacks um i usually wait till something tells me it's pretty much not getting any photosynthesis from those leaves in order for me to cut it back so mountain mint tends to hold on to its foliage for a while i think a lot of the time mine starts to look icky depending on the year around De december so that's when i'll cut it back just to avoid like disease and stuff um what was the other mountain mint related? Grow in the shade. So I thought it was a full sun plant, but when I was hiking, I it stopped me in the tracks. I saw some Cleone glabra, which is native white turtle heads, and some Physostesias, another plant native that I didn't bring today. Um, we sell both of those. Uh, the Physostesia and the obedient, or the obedient plant, and the turtle heads were growing on the edge of the forest line with mountain mint amongst them. Um, again, it was a hike, so I don't know what the full range of light in that location is. Apparently there's an app called Sunseeker if you're struggling with assessing that at your own home. Um, but that leads me to believe since it's growing with the, the uh, Cleone glabra, the turtle head, that it can take a little bit more shade. I wouldn't grow it in anything less than four hours of direct sun um, just because it'll probably get leggy. And that mountain mint that I saw growing on the edge of the tree line definitely looked leggy. She was like this tall and yeah. <laughs>
I can't hear you. Thank you. I was muted. Oh man, I was trying to answer questions at the same time. A little too much multitasking. All right, sorry guys. It is one o'clock, so I know we have a few more questions coming in. Um, just a reminder: if you didn't get your question answered, go to your confirmation email. If you hit reply to that, the emails come straight to me. I can share those with Caitlin. Um, there, we're sending out the recording tomorrow. I'll be typing up a plant list. Uh, from the chat section. Um, so Caitlin, is there anything you'd like to close with before we wrap up for the day? Um, well, in closing, thank you everyone. I hope you're kind as far as this being my first Zoom. Um, and also thank you for your interest in native gardening. Um, I think it's really important that we assess whether or not we wanna be idealistic and stick to our straight species like my, uh, excuse me, my root Becky is, or if we're compromising and just want to help further a movement and do some more native ours. Either way, a garden, a backyard that we personally enjoy that looks good as well as entices others to join that movement and encourages more biodiversity for our native ecosystem, um, the better. So please keep planting and be kind to your natives. And we'll have ephemerals this spring. So be on the lookout for things like your Virginia bluebells, and hopefully we'll get in some of that Michella repens and hepaticas. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Everybody have a great day and we will see you all for our next class. Bye all. <laughs> Bye.